Okay, you can start. Okay, great. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the uh, fireside chat of why human intelligence is needed in media accessibility. My name is Francis West. I'm the founder of Francis West and Co., and also author of the book Authentic Inclusion Drives Disruptive Innovation. I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be here, even though virtually, my apology to the Zero Project for not being able to make it in person, um, to introduce to you um, Josh Miller, who is the co-founder of 3Play Media. Um, 3Play Media is one of the leading uh, companies that providing uh, media captioning services um, not just in the United States, but in Canada and other places as well. And I think you're going to find this conversation that we're going to have in the next 30 minutes uh, very, very enlightening because um, what we have known as the captioning uh, technology, especially for helping people who have hearing um, difficulties, has really evolved significantly. It's becoming what I call the human first platform in that everybody can benefit from this particular um, technology. And so what I want to do is to um, um, give uh, Josh the opportunity to give him maybe a quick introduction of himself and also to talk to us about what are some of the major trends that he's noticing uh, with his customers and also with his industry colleagues in the uh, media accessibility area. So Josh, please. All right, thank you, Francis. Uh, and, and I wanna repeat what Francis said, I wish I could be there in person, but happy to be able to participate uh, nonetheless. Um, so I'm Josh Miller, I'm one of the founders and co-CEO of 3Play Media. Uh, we are focused on media accessibility, as Francis said, and really driving home a high quality, high scale solution. So uh, really thinking about how to use technology along with humans uh, to deliver near perfection, uh, but at a level of, of both throughput and, and um, speed that is not necessarily the norm in, in the media accessibility space. So that uh, includes closed captioning, now live captioning, audio description, subtitling, and so on. And we really think about the idea of you know, accessibility and the way media has, has evolved as providing access to consuming content in any way someone wants to consume it. Um, and that could be because of a need, it be, could be because of a preference, uh, but the idea is that people consume content in different ways and we need to enable that. Um, and as the content publisher, our hope would be uh, to think of it that way too, is that you know, you've know you spent all this time creating the content, in some cases spent a lot of money creating content, we should you know, do everything possible to make sure everyone who we want is consuming that content and you know, whatever means is necessary. Um, you know, when it comes to some of the trends, and you know, I'll, I'll just highlight a couple before we go deeper on some. You know, certainly with everything going on with ChatGPT, it's hard to ignore speech recognition. Um, I will say that we started using speech recognition from the from day one. Uh, that that is how we built up our captioning solution, where we start with speech recognition and have a whole cleanup and QC process uh, on top of that. Uh, but speech recognition, no question, and what's happening between the explosion of content and the improvements in technology, it's hard to ignore what's what's possible there. Um, I think audio description is a really interesting one. Uh, there's more awareness and, and recognition that audio description for blind and low vision users is necessary. Um, and the technology is finally getting to a point where it can be supported better for the users. Um, that's been one of the biggest barriers as we've moved to a, a more of an online streaming uh, environment. Uh, and the the other I think is language, right? And, and and seeing what where do we go? How do we expand uh, with a global audience, with a global environment, uh, and making sure that everyone can consume content? So those are just a few that we're paying a lot of attention to, um, and uh, yeah, I think those tie into a number of other even larger macro uh, trends that that we should be talking about. You know, I know, you know Francis is extremely involved with, with uh, technology and the aging population. I think you know, no question. Accessibility for media plays right into that. So there's, there's some really interesting tie-ins there too. Well, thank you, Josh, um, for giving us a, a, a such a, um, a rich kind of a description of some of the uh, major trends. And 
Zero Projects uh, conference theme this year is is about one of the uh, area is about policy, right? And I can still remember in the year 2000s, we were um, when I was still working at IBM as IBM's um, um, assess a chief accessibility officer, were very involved um, with um, the CVAA or the um, uh, the captioning video uh, act of the United States, and actually was sponsored by our home state uh, senator, uh, Senator Markey. Uh, um, so I wonder whether you can just speak to a little bit to about you know, um, the policy impact on business, right? I mean, um, you and I are technologists and both of us uh, work for a for-profit business. And um, uh, and for you personally, I know that, um, you know, you actually started the business with the intent to be, you know, helping people with disabilities. I wonder to what extent is your personal decision in making a me, uh, accessible media business uh, come into play and how is that related to or does it have any any kind of relationship to for example a policy such as um, the captioning um, a video captioning uh, uh, legislation of the United States it's a great question um, and I, I think it's it's a complicated answer I would say and and, and policy in, in this space whether we like it or not has a huge role um, and I think we all, I think everyone here, I'm preaching to the choir a bit, we all wish we didn't need the policy to drive home these changes and to uh, innate, you know, force certain organizations to implement certain accessible practices. Um, but sometimes that is necessary. Uh, and sometimes that's what's necessary to help people understand how important it is. Uh, because it's so easy to ignore a population if you don't experience it yourself. Um, so when we got started, one of the things, uh, we, we were lucky in that we had a customer before a fully developed product. So we had a group that at MIT, MIT Open Courseware, who was putting lectures up online for free, uh, really the first group to do that um, at, at scale um, before some of these MOOCs that have, have come about and uh, they needed to add captions to their video. And so when we started just engaging with them, really almost by, by coincidence, uh, we recognized very quickly that there were no, not really many compelling solutions out there, that all of the solutions that really had any um, real uh, traction were focused on the broadcast industry because that's where policy existed. Uh, and they had not done anything all that innovative other than serve the, the current need. Our view was, you know, this was the beginning of, of the kind of streaming explosion. This was going to affect uh, video all over the place, and there needed to be a better solution. Technology had to be used more thoughtfully, uh, and that policy would come. Uh, and that whether, you know, our, our view was certainly that it, captioning in particular and transcription uh, led to so many other improvements in the in the user consumption model or in, in engagement and video search all these other things that you can do with video that everybody would want this uh, the reality was things like the cbaa um, and the, uh, the enforcement of the ada uh, were two major uh, turning points for us as a business uh, and certainly the industry where that where that changes things and where policy can help quite a bit is that it it does bring awareness to the table and that when more organizations are forced to do something, other people start to get exposed to it, maybe don't need it, but benefit from it. And so Derek Featherstone, who's you know active in the accessibility community, uh, used the line that you know, today's accessibility requirement is tomorrow's usability standard. I, I personally love that concept uh, because it's this idea that Yes, we're solving for accessibility today, but guess what? Everybody's going to benefit from this down the road, and we should think about it that, that way. That usability is, you know, and accessibility and this idea of universal design are, is very real, um, and people need to appreciate that. And so today we see article after article about what, well, why do all the twenty somethings, why does Gen Z love captions? Um, and you know, there you know, there are lots of theories, but it, the number of people I speak to today who have captions on all the time. And it's not because they have any kind of hearing issue or anything like that. 
it's just because it's a preference now and it's actually a usability improvement. So um, I think that as we, as we raise awareness uh, with many of these solutions, people realize that this is good for everyone. Yeah, I just um, want to um, kind of um, go back a little bit and, and, and talked about, you mentioned that um, legislation does, lead, does create a demand, but I also, I think you will agree that, um, you know, sometimes legislation establish the kind of what I call the baseline, right, the minimum, the minimum. and what in order for business really to thrive and to differentiate and also to compete, um, one has to be really thinking about innovation constantly and not just meeting the minimum requirement. And on that note, you mentioned MOOC. And so for our um, MOOC, for our uh, international audience, that actually stands for the Massive uh, Open Online Course. So started in the um, year 2000, a lot of the major leading universities like Harvard and MIT, which Josh, I know uh, you went to, uh, start putting their uh, courseware online to allow anybody to have access. And But the fact that these um, courses are taught by professors with great content, but if it's not captioned, then if you're hearing impaired, or you, for that matter, you could be a, um, a non-native language learner like myself. English is not my first language. I always benefit from the what I call the bimodal support, meaning, you know, listen, but then if there is a captioning of text that actually help me with my comprehension and my understanding and my processing of the information. So, I mean, the fact that you took it a problem in this case, you know, uh, massive uh, online courses and realizing that a technology can be used um, to address that at scale is, is is a great example of innovation. And and so earlier you mentioned uh, chat GPT and for me who has been uh, who has been working in the accessibility technology area for now I want to say now two decades now is I'm going to date myself now um, but that's okay you know, because aging is also another a great topic uh, at the conference. So I feel like I can be an expert just by the fact that I am aging uh, in that. But I think of all the technology that uh, that I've been uh, been exposed to, this um, speech to text technology is probably one of the fastest moving technology. And also, I know that you probably know just recently. Uh, between Google, Microsoft, you know, all the company are coming together, are creating data models, right, or speech models. And um, and uh, I I wonder you can uh, speak more about, you know, there's two two school of thoughts right now. It's like, oh my gosh, ChatGPT, artificial intelligence is going to take over the world. You know, that human will be left with nothing to do, with no jobs. Uh, but the other camp says, you know. A technology is evolving, and, and AI like ChatGPT could be there to be used. Uh, so, how do you bridge this kind of very diverse understanding of where technology is, is is going to? And and can you speak to why, for example, a company like Three Play Media are continue to to um, to be excited about this this whole space, even though theoretically, if you listen to one camp. That AI or or the open source you know technology can just take over everything. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's right. I think there's a a valid concern amongst a number of people that AI and, and AI like uh, at, you know, tools can put things out of business or uh, take over in ways that may or may not be uh, healthy. We'll just say. Um, so you know, first let me talk about the speech recognition component because that is something we're so deeply familiar with and when we started that is what how, how we got going was to say could speech recognition solve this problem uh, the answer was no uh, this is 15 years ago speech recognition is not anywhere near what it is today it has absolutely come leaps and bounds as francis said uh, and it, that's really important to recognize so for for us what we did is built a solution where we start with speech recognition clean it up, QC it. So by the end, you have a pretty much a perfect transcript and caption file. And, and we're putting in things like speaker IDs, uh, non-spoken elements that are required for captions, and certainly lots and lots of corrections. Um, the, the, the leap from 
a speech recognition generated output to a finished caption file is pretty significant. Um, but that gap is definitely narrowing. And so for us, that gap is where the human comes in. And the more that gap gets narrowed for years, we looked at that as a good thing because it sped up the process and it reduced our costs and so on. Where we are today is that you actually have to stare at it in some cases, not all, and, then, and I would even say mostly uh, not in, in very few, but in, uh, in some cases you have to look at it and say, could speech recognition solve this on its own and be good enough? Um, and it goes back to that question of what's the minimum bar um, which is not what we want to solve for, but sometimes we, you know, we should be pragmatic and, and recognize when that is appropriate um, for certain use cases. Uh, at a higher level, the way we've always thought about speech recognition is that it's a tool. It's not the answer, it's a tool. And it all comes down to how do you use that tool uh, to get to your final solution. I think that's where ChatGPT and all these other AI solutions come into play and people need to uh, think about is how is this a useful tool, um, not how is this going to solve the problem on its own. And you know what, what's so interesting about ChatGPT, in my opinion, is that uh, the big difference in terms of what they're doing and what's been done in the past is they've just made it easy to use for the general public. Uh, they put it into a really nice user interface that's, you know, like a chat bot and people are relatively comfortable interacting with a tool like that. Um, and what it's doing is essentially just aggregating an enormous amount of information very, very quickly. Uh, and, and you could argue applying a slight intelligence layer, but it's still up to the human to interpret whether this is a useful piece of information. And I think that's so critical um, in, in certainly the way we do things. You get a starting point, but someone has to decide and curate that data and say, is this the right data? Is it the wrong data? And then can we train the model to make it better so that next time it gets better and better and better? But that will that, that basically requires a human in the loop it, it, pretty much all the time to just make sure, because the outcomes when there is no oversight can be pretty dangerous. And we saw an event this week with uh, I think it was Vanderbilt got a, you know started off a message to their students about a tragedy uh, at Michigan State, uh, and they used ChatGPT to uh, send the message uh, or to design the message. Um, that created an enormous amount of backlash uh, because there were some things in the message that uh, maybe weren't ideal, um, and we're seeing organizations already ban the use of ChatGPT. And you know I wouldn't say that that's necessarily a good thing either. Um, it can be a really useful tool if you know how to use it. Um, so that's the part of here that I think gets um, so interesting is, it, yes, some of these tools can be controversial, but they're, they only become controversial because people are letting them fly without any kind of curation and interpretation. Um, being able to process that kind of information that fast is really, really interesting. Um, but I mean, even the ChatGPT team and, and people at OpenAI have openly said, you know, on their site, even ChatGPT sometimes writes plausible sounding but incorrect and nonsensical answers. So right off the bat, they're being pretty open about the fact that this is a tool, right? This is not the answer and you need to figure out what to do with it. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with you. I think anytime a technology that can really kind of create um, excitement and then there is a massive adoption, like uh, ChatGPT really just came onto the scene, it's actually not a bad thing, right? I mean, especially earlier we talked about seniors, um, you know, um, to have a technology that is so easy, relatively easy to interface with and bring back certain information, um, it, it's, it's a good thing, right? And uh, it's almost, to me, it's almost like Wikipedia on Turbo, right? I mean, um, after a while, everybody realized even Wikipedia is written by an individual, so the source could be questionable. But then on the other hand, when you want to do a quick read or quick understanding of a company or a concept, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of times with the millennials, they use these jargon with Gen Zers, you know. I always like to just Google it, and then that's when uh, ChatGPT kind of uh, a technology come in handy. But I think, like you said, 
you know, it's so important that we understand after all, it is, it is developed by human and that's curated by human and that if we're going to use the technology in a very serious setting or a consequential setting, that that person intervention or integration is absolutely uh, important. I know you and I, as uh, preparation for this uh, for this fire uh, side chat, we talked a little bit about, you know, what I call the fake news versus facts based news, right? And um, and then so could you maybe you know just kind of share with the audience, you know, this is I think is a good example of how let's say even captioning, you know, with a human interaction or human intervention is is it can be uh it can be important. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's critical. I mean, what we see now with so much live content, for example, there are there are not enough live captioners in the world as we stand today to to actually live caption all of that content. Uh, well, there's, there's just no way. Uh, so in comes you know speech recognition as an interesting solution. Can we use live speech recognition uh, to solve this? Sometimes the answer is yeah. yeah you can you can actually do pretty well. And we should recognize that there are some real advantages of using technology. But when you add a human layer to curate that machine or that model, um, you can get leaps and bounds better so that you're getting things like the jargon, the if it's local news, the, the local cities and towns, um, and the names of the mayor, and, and things like that that you would never have in a speech recognition engine that's made more generically. Uh, but when you curate that model, uh, for a very specific purpose, which requires far less time than full human captioning. But because of the circumstances of the content, you can actually start doing really, really well with a largely automated solution. So, yeah, and I think that that curation layer and that intervention layer is so critical to uh, solve the problem. Uh, we, we see it in a lot of different ways. And you know, we're, we're doing our own modeling all the time uh, even though we're not delivering pure speech recognition all the time. So it's, it, to us, it's all about how do we continually optimize. I think we all should be thinking about that too. And, and when it comes to ChatGPT, I think you said it right. It's, it, ultimately, it's, it's building off of human created content for the most part. Um, and so we have to decide what is that worth to us, right? And what does that mean? Do we believe it? Do we not believe it? Um, and then, you know, how do you? How do you correct and, and use it in a way that makes a lot of sense? So, you know, I think live is one of the most interesting examples where um, little bits of curation can make very large improvements so that you can use a more machine only approach as opposed to needing a human all the time. Uh, and so we're seeing that a little more and more and some pretty interesting uh, ways to play with data in, in that live market in particular. And a lot of it comes down to because of a need, right? And that the, there's a real uh, a need to do things differently. Um, and we need to be realistic about how to do that. Because otherwise, all that live content is going to go on caption. Uh, if we don't come up with a better solution that is uh, appropriate for what uh, what is doable, that stuff won't get caught in caption, and that's a problem. Yeah, when you say live, I mean, there's like, there's like the live, um, event or life happening and then there's a live person you know uh, of interacting right i mean uh, we all i wasn't i was actually in taiwan but i watched the the after fact of a super bowl uh everybody talked about the game but they also talked about the the sign language um interpreter uh for rihanna you know uh, of the halftime show and how powerful that individual was able to, um, you know, not just interpret the song, but project, you know, meaning and emotional connection uh, even further than the, uh, I mean, I will say further than Rihanna, but I think it really uh, amplified the impact of her song and the fact that, you know, they chose to have a, you know, a, a stunning, um, interpreter for that event was was in, it was just a great example of how human and technology and also the thoughtfulness you know that 
that uh, has to be built in into a production, so to speak. I mean, we all know the halftime definitely is a production. So I think it's um, it's very telling, especially for like a platform like three play media platform. You know, you you talked about you know kind of the intentional design, you know, kind of a thinking is so important to scale the technology um, and to make it a you know usable um, at, at scale. Um, I mean, we still have a few more minutes left, and I wonder, you know, from your perspective as you look into the future, what are some of the um, you know, both the opportunity areas or the challenge areas that you see uh, as a, you know, as a as a technologist, as a business leader, uh, or just a human in general, you know, where where the trends and directions are going. Yeah. So, so I will say, um, I do think one of the challenges is everything we've just been talking about, which is the understanding of what a machine can do and not do, right, and and how to how are we all going to put them to use in ways that are healthy and beneficial and not dangerous? Uh, so uh, I, I'm far more positive than negative when it comes to these types of tools and, and more excited than not about the development, but I also have some caution in that uh, they can be misused, right? So I think that that is something that is a very real challenge that we all have to grapple with and figure out how do we how do we implement them in ways that are beneficial for all of us. Um, on the on the on the more kind of interesting trends and opportunities, I think what we're seeing is um, something really interesting finally happening with audio description for blind and low vision users. Um, how can we make that continue to make that more scalable and a better experience for the consumer? Uh, and I think on that note, one of the trends that I think is really interesting is that we're finally getting more feedback from users. Um, I think it's you know, kind of uh, crazy to think how little feedback we've gotten uh, over the years uh, when it comes to captioning and audio description. Uh, the idea that synthesized voice may or may not be appropriate for audio description, um, that sometimes you need a human voice. Um, and then on that note, can you uh, create models for a fake human voice that's close enough. I mean, there, there's a lot going on uh, with uh, internationalizing voices uh, for for consumption, which is pretty interesting. Um, but I think that that's a that's an area that, that's really interesting in, in terms of audio description uh, that, that we're paying a lot of attention to. Um, and again, it comes back to awareness and understanding of you know what's needed to to implement it well. I think with all of these things we're talking about when it comes to accessibility, you know, you mentioned the aging population, um, whether we like it or not, aging correlates very tightly with uh, certain disabilities, um, certainly around uh, hearing and vision, uh, and, and these are going to play in. And what's especially unique right now compared to, say, 20 years ago, is that the aging population actually understands how to use technology. Um, and they, you know, we're not teaching people how to use technology for the first time. So how do we how do we take advantage of that to make their lives better as they age? Um, I think that's really really important, especially with media. I mean, everyone's consuming, you know, I don't know how many different packages of, of uh, OTT platforms plus their cable package and who knows what else. But content's everywhere. So um, so we need to we need to really pay attention to that. And, and those are some of the. Those are some of the big ones that we are paying a lot of attention to. Yeah, so I think uh, what you mentioned is that um, one of the things that what machine can do and, and cannot do, um, it is going to be the, you know, the biggest uh, challenge, but also opportunity. And I know you and your um, colleague at 3Play Media has talked a lot, and, and uh, certainly from my perspective, uh, after being in this, um, disability business uh, or accessibility business for 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 a while is that it is so important that as we continue to uh, either develop or enhance the technology platform, we need to have diversity and inclusion of you know people um, providing the kind of input and insight uh, com continuously, you know, not just a one off, right? Because that's how you can make sure that what whatever. Um, 
at scale machine solution you produce actually address the, the, the human needs and individually. And also the mentioning of audio uh, description, I too agree that that's going to be one of the biggest area because it's just natural um, to want to have that, that convenience. And sometimes um, I have a four-year-old uh, granddaughter and the parents just told me that she now prefers to listen to books, you know, uh, in addition to reading books. Because when you listen to a book, it, uh, her mind actually gets um, more imaginative, you know, and she can think about. I remember when I was growing up radio, uh, listening to radio shows, you know, you can really have that freedom of imagination. So I think audio um, description or uh, it's going to be a, a area that's just going to be natural and then that potentially can drive uh, imagination and innovation. And last but not the least, as we uh, bring this uh, fireside chat to an end, I can't believe the 30 minutes has gone by already, is that, you know, we started out, I mean, Zero Project has done a tremendous job uh, bringing together policymakers in, uh, and also community participants uh, and an embedding and a technologist part of the uh, conference theme. And I think in the area of uh, captioning, it really is a great example of global policy on captioning, helping people who, you know, start out with a disability or accessibility in mind, but it's really about what I call the human first, you know, natural um, uh, requirement or, or needs. And, and now that uh, we are um, at the stage where the market expanding to include like aging, it's so important that we, we have different people with different age and different ability be part of part of this uh, part of this new invention or reinvention or up reinvention. Um, I want to thank you, um, Josh, for taking time out. I know it's uh, early for you. Uh, and also this is a, a school holiday week uh, to be coming on. But perhaps you and I can uh, make it to Vienna next year together in person because a zero project conference is is really one of the uh, not just uh, unique but uh, very impactful uh, conference. So again, we thank uh, Zero Project for giving us this opportunity uh, to talk about um, human uh, interaction and human impact on accessible uh, media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. And I'll just say one last thing is that I, I think it's so critical that uh, Francis mentioned is that the policy is so, so important to help get these things along the way and make progress. Yet we also shouldn't be settling for the minimum, right? And that minimum bar uh, is not where we should be striving for. And that's the beauty of, of technology is that we do have the opportunity to do so much more um, and we should. And so we should, we should hold people to a higher standard. We should expect uh, great solutions when it comes to accessibility and, and we can. Great so, final yeah. wrap up uh, comments. Well, thank you again and thank you uh, Zero Projects. And uh, I guess we'll try to see you next year. Bye-bye.